you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Thechrisvossshow.com. Welcome to the Chris Voss Show, folks. My family and friends, the great family of the Chris Voss Show podcast, the podcast that loves you but doesn't judge you, at least not as harshly as your mother-in-law because you didn't get your wife, uh, the you forgot her anniversary, and she'll never let you live it down. <laughs> Uh, that's a good one. Just came up with. Uh, so, guys, uh, as always, we certainly appreciate the five star review you should give us over there on the iTunes. I just love you guys so much. Uh, one of the recent posts was what I love about this podcast is the host. Chris is able to bring out the best out of the guest to provide optimal benefit to the listener. This is the reason this podcast is rated so highly. It is. And uh, there's no better than Chris Voss. And nothing screams my egotistical narcissism to be set off than writing uh, reviews like that. So thank you very much for whoever wrote that. And uh, I'll just put that up on my wall and frame it. In fact, maybe we should just put a, reviews behind us and frame them. So anyway, uh, if you guys haven't gotten a chance, please support the show. For the love of God, please support the show. Go to goodreads.com, for chess Chris Voss, youtube.com, for chess Chris Voss, uh, linkedin.com, for chess Chris Voss. Make sure you subscribe to that LinkedIn newsletter. That thing grows by like 50 to 100 people a day, and we've been doing it for uh, a couple of years now, I think. It's crazy. It's insane the way wow. it grows. And I'm just like... Holy crap, who keeps subscribing this thing? I didn't know there's many users on LinkedIn, but I guess there are. Uh, anyway, guys, uh, also, uh, what was it TikTok or Chris Voss one? We're going to be talking spycraft today and spycraft on how you can use the te tools and techniques of spies or spooks, sometimes as they're called in the business, uh, and how you can learn that to analyze people, to understand people better, to evaluate people, and uh, also uh, use that for business and how you can do business deals, negotiations, uh, how to get maybe more out of your teammates. Because if they don't do what you want, you have the black helicopters uh, pick them up and ship them off to Poland in some dungeon uh, thing. And uh, then you strap on the battery packs and the jumper cables. Anyway, because uh, we've all want to do that to Bob in the office because he can't work the pop paper copy or right but that's another story we'll see if we can we see if we can get our current guests to do that uh today we have an amazing gentleman on the show jj brune i'm gonna try and make a stab at that he is known and uh basically trademarked as the retired spy and you're gonna learn a lot about his stuff he's operative 130 or 431 we'll find out what that means as a seasoned veteran of the intelligence branch of the canadian armed forces he served with distinction as a contract handler on the ground in bosnia and herzegovina uh he uh spent years in the discreet world of the human intelligence and counter human intelligence having driven his desire to understand humans behavior intricacies and pass on the complex notion of interpersonal communication he's retired from active duty now and he realized that much of what he learned could be utilized in the civilian world based on the four temperament disc model of human behavior to better understand any maximize human dynamics and his exclusive training programs provide a comprehensive analyst of communication techniques empowering individuals to enhance authentic relationships promote trust innovation and productivity or sends them to the uh the uh, shadow realm uh welcome to the show jj how are you excellent thank you there you go it's excellent to have you <clears throat> i'm losing my voice uh, go ahead and give me your full name i think uh we set up in your dot coms wherever people can find you on the interwebs so the full name is uh it's french so the full name is jean jacques joseph brun and i go by jj when i was working overseas they couldn't pronounce my name uh, so they then became uh, John Jack. Hey, John Jack. And uh, they would you know, think they were bilingual. I was working at the safe house one day, and then there was a British colleague that came into the ops room, and he needed something on my desk. And he just said, hi, Jai Jai. And I connected the dots, Jean Jacques. Okay, JJ, in turn, <laughs> and I answered, and I got branded. There you so, go. 
the story is if you don't brand yourself, somebody else will. So for me, it worked out because it's, it made it easier for everybody to remember my name. Uh, and it also, when I messed up uh, overseas, uh, Canada did not know who this JJ was because ah. that was not my official name on paper. <laughs> so it worked out. That was my I'm assuming that's your real name. <laughs> uh, did we get your .com? I think we did. Did we? Uh, it's yeah. It's as simple as the retired spy dot com. Everything is there, and it's in hey both official Canadian language, French, and in English. So there you go. So give me a thirty thousand overview. Give us a summation of what you do and how you do it for your clients and and the work that you're doing now. Uh, bottom line for us is it equipping people for works of service. So mm -hmm. when twenty years in the military, um, I specialize in the field of human intelligence. And I had to go to a, you know, a war zone to learn how to build relationships. Mm -hmm. um, but I was, I was going to be evaluated by my ability to build relationships. Um, and then from there, I just saw the value of having a model of reference that quite often, uh, whether it's in your business or in your personal life, if you do not have a model of reference, you will often find yourself at a disadvantage. So go. I got interested in uh, temperaments, personalities, people's character, people's preferences. And from there, I was able to discover mine uh, so that I can see others and then how to flex and adapt and then how to apply it with everybody else within an organization. So in the civilian side of things, as in I said, you know what, after 20 years, it was time for me to pull the pin. Um, but now I do more work for Canadian government, whether it's the federal, provincial, or the municipalities uh, outside than when I was in uniform. And it's all mm -hmm. about providing them the resources for them to um, utilize a model of reference when interacting with people. So at the level that I'm at, I train their trainers. So as opposed to having me on site, I will go and train their cadre so mm -hmm. that they can start doing their own internal training inside their organization. So from law enforcement to the Canadian revenue agency, to the Canada school of public service, uh, I train their trainers and then for them to apply the four temperament model often referred to as just a disc model into their specific areas of expertise mm -hmm. or requirements that they have. There you go. Canadian. Is Justin Trudeau as good looking, as ridiculously good looking as he seems uh, in person as he seems on TV? He, he is definitely <laughs> taller. I've, uh, I, uh, one time I had, uh, I bidded on a uh, lunch at the at Parliament. So mm. we're going to meet a senator, we're going to have lunch. And as he was not the prime minister at the time, so we were, as we were waiting to, to go uh, and meet the senator, uh, Justin Trudeau just passed by and he is one tall gentleman. He's like, really? uh, yeah, yeah, he doesn't look it on TV, but, uh, I think he's like six, two, very thin. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely like, uh, you know, he double look. Whoa. Um, yeah. I didn't think he was that tall. Yeah. So he's, he's taller than me. I'm so I'm six. So I, I got a, you know, he got a double look for me. He said, what? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. he's much bigger, uh, in person than, than he looks on TV. There you go. Uh, so uh, give us a story of yourself. How did you grow up? What was your hero's journey? What, what, what got you into the spy business or wanting to get into the spy business, et cetera, et cetera? Well, for me, the, the military was an exit strategy. So I, I, I'm born and raised in a small village, uh, entrepreneurial uh, background. So my father uh, you know, managed a gas station, uh, a sawmill, and a chip harvester. Uh, where, you know, you would uh, cut the trees down and turn it into wood chips and then sell it at the sawmill. Mm -hmm. So the whole village uh, lived off lumber. Lumber was sort of like the industry. And at a very young age, uh, we, we just, that's what we learned as in the entrepreneurial. Uh, but dad always professed, you know, get yourself a good, safe federal job. Uh, and so he always planted that seed uh, because he had to, you know, he would leave at six, at seven, six or seven o'clock in the morning and come back at seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night. Wow. Uh, and then he didn't want that because my dad said, you, son, you've never been in business until you had a payroll. Because <laughs> you, you have to pay somebody else first before you pay yourself. That's true. And, and he was, he was struggling. Uh, and then he had, uh, he had big dreams. He wanted to accomplish a lot of things. 
because uh, he, he came out of college to help his dad run the business and he never got an opportunity to finish his college mm. and, and his university. So, um, so he got stuck in, in that area. And um, I started at a very young age working at the gas station. My brother at a very young age working at the sawmill. Um, and at one point he wanted us to go to university and, and I was wired to go to university. Um, and, but I only had five, $5 a day for meals back wow. then. It was like, it was in the eighties, mid eighties. Yeah. I remember and, that. Was, yeah. The Roman days. And, and just, it, and it was just tough. And my dad didn't have the money to pay for the tuition and everything. But one day mm -hmm. I arrived at home and I had a nice, you know, Laurentian university broidered sweatshirt. Uh, Cause I was a shot putter uh, for the university mm -hmm. and so the pride, you know, it wasn't the leather jacket, but a nice embroidered uh, university uh, sweatshirt. And my dad looked at that and said, where did you get that? I says, well, I bought it. Where did you buy that at the university who paid for that? And like, I knew, I, I knew where we were going. <laughs> so I did, where did you get your money? I worked this summer. Where did you work this summer at the garage? Who owns the garage? You do. So who paid for that? Uh <laughs> And it's just that he was son. There's so much financial pressure. Like my dad had uh, visited the hospital on two or three occasions with ulcers because when the sawmill went on strike, the bank was still calling for the payments. Oh, so wow. I, you're too young. You don't know this. Yeah. Uh, and, but for me, it's okay. Check mark. And two weeks after that, I found myself in basic training and uh, joined the military. So the military for me was an exit strategy. I was, I was, I was, I was tired of being told what to do. So I joined the military mm. uh, and that did not make any sense. And then after three days, you know, people yelling at you and sh and, and then you, know, uh, you get shaved and, and it's just a different culture because I had no formal training in any type of uh, the cadets or the reserves or anything like that. And I just thought those people are crazy. And I called back home and I was talking to my mom, say, hey, you know, mom, uh, I'll make peace with that. I'll get a mentor, a tutor. I'm not going to lose my first year. Uh, I want to come back. And my dad was listening on the second line. Oh. And he said, you've made your bed, son. And he hung up the phone. Whoa. Yeah. So at the age of 19, best, best thing ever. Wow. Now, back then yeah. it was like crap. Uh, <laughs> because there's no guarantee you're going to pass uh, boot camp, you know, yeah. it's, it's like they were 40 and they only need 20 of us. So wow. look, look on the left, look on your right. One of you is not going to be here at the end. So, wow. and for me, it's like a failing was not an option. I absolutely mm -hmm. had to pass the training. So fast forward, a very successful uh, career. Cause my first uh, session was uh, with the combat arms. So that's the French regiment would be the Royal 22e Regiment. So the Royal 22nd Regiment, mm. uh, the Vandus, often they would be referred to as the Vandus. And uh, what takes you eight years to accomplish, uh, mm. I did it in less than four years. Blessing and a curse uh, because you're the, you're the new type of soldier. Mm -hmm. You're bilingual, you're computer literate, you know, you got a good physique. Uh, so you're the new, new generation, but the old guard doesn't like you because you haven't suffered uh -huh. like they've suffered. So uh -huh. after a while, as in, well, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of, of this internal fighting. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to switch career, switch lane. And that's what got me interested in the intelligence mm -hmm. branch, uh, applied, got recommended and then moved. And again, a rapid progression within, uh, that industry. So I was able to do. Uh, two things as and I started within the uh, non-commissioned officer and then I finished as a staff officer. So I've done the blue collar and the white collar. So mm -hmm. a total of 20 years in the military, 15, uh, uh, yeah, 15 years was really uh, in uniform and then or, or the, the non-commissioned and then the last five as a staff officer specializing in the field of human intelligence. And that's how I got interested in that whole area and back then in the military my claim to fame is being the first one selected for the role of a contact handler mm. contact handler back then uh <clears throat> was sent into a hostile environment so for me my timeline was bosnia the war in bosnia where a contact handler is sent to a hostile environment where he or she has to cultivate 
sources, build relationships by design, mm -hmm. determine their intentions, you know, and modify their behaviors without the use of any Jedi mind tricks. Uh, basically, get them to be an informant. They, you know, get them to share what they've seen and what they've observed and, uh, on the field. And at the end, I had 100 eyeballs uh, working uh, on our behalf all across so that then we could advise our commanding officer what was happening on the terrain mm -hmm. so that they can inform and uh, make an informed decision as to where to put the resources uh, in Bosnia uh, at that time. So being the first Canadian in a multinational, uh, we had anywhere from five to seven different nationalities. Wow. English was the working language. Mm -hmm. Now I speak three languages in Europe. Quite often they'll speak five, if not uh, more. Mm -hmm. English would be their fifth or their sixth language. Uh, so it was quite interesting in regards to, did you understand what I meant for you to understand? Even yeah. our commanding officer, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but he had one of these thick British accent and he had this town hall meeting where he got all the contact handlers, eh, eh, like this, talk about a, a very good target of all the operatives were all in one area. We could have gotten taken out right there. And he does his presentation, cast out his vision for the tour, what's going to happen. But at the end, he finishes with his, his big British accent. I know you think you understand what I just said, but I'm not really sure. But what you understand is what I meant for you to understand, laddies. Do you understand? And I was looking on the left and then the right, and I'm like, wow, that's going to be a long six months. Was that Sean Connery? <laughs> well, it was thick. Well, so okay. anyone from the UK, yeah. they're just going to crucify yeah. me because it was a bad uh, imitation of it. But <laughs> it, at the it's end, okay. did you understand what I meant for you to understand? <clears throat> and communication is so simple. It's just not easy Yeah, uh, that you have to realize that when communication breaks down, blame the process, not the person. Oh. They may not have understood what you were trying to communicate to them. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole area of learning to say the same thing in a different way of decoding one's preferred communication style uh, so that uh, you're able to um, be um, they're able to receive your offer versus resist your offer in building those relationships and getting them to to share their their secrets. And so, being a handler is a dangerous business, right? I mean, right? You can be exposed or it's, you know, it's you end up in their gulag. Today. Uh, Chris, it's different today. Uh, like I have two operational tours. I have a uh, peacekeeping in Cyprus uh, underneath my belt, and I have peacemaking in in Bosnia. Uh, from that transition, we we left Bosnia to go to Afghanistan. So the the role of a contact handler in Afghanistan is completely different uh, because you need even more resources. You need a, a you need cover teams to to go with you when you're moving. Uh, so it's, it's quite different because of the environment's change. And as the environment changes, you also have to adapt the role of a contact handler. So I had it pretty um, easy or safe mm -hmm. compared to the teams in, in Afghanistan because that terrain was more aggressive, uh, more labor intensive. Uh, it's just rugged terrain. Uh, the danger was much, much higher in Afghanistan than it was, it was manageable in Bosnia where we lived. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a safe house, but then again, it wasn't that safe because uh, here's it's a villa uh -huh. and it's not even fenced in and you've got all these military vehicles, green targets, mm -hmm. and all these people dressed in green telling people, here are the targets. Uh, so we were not uh, allowed to, um, to be out of uniform. Mm -hmm. So it was part of the Dayton Agreement. Uh, <clears throat> like your weapon has to be, uh, you can't have a concealed weapon on you. You have to show your weapon. So your wow. pistol or your long rifle, you're dressed in green. Yeah, you have a role and it was different. Uh, I could go out, uh, two man team. Uh, sometimes we needed, uh, two vehicles so a four man team to go out when it was hostile. Uh, but you were able to get around with a uh, two man team to, uh, the meets the location that you need to, to like, when we had to connect with that, uh, the, the self-declared, well, we branded him as a self-declared mayor uh, of Mostar. So Mostar is why I, where I played. So if you know where Sarajevo is, you just have to go south. And there's a place called Mostar. Translated, that means bridges, bridge. Mm. 
and that river, the, the Red River River had like four or five bridges uh, across it. Uh, very strategic town uh, mm -hmm. because you get access to the ocean. If you, if you can control that city, you can then have access to uh, Dubrovnik all mm -hmm. the way down there on the coast. So but it's, uh, we're working with the, the Serbs, the Croats, and the Muslims, the main three ethnicities that were there. And you have to build relationships with the Serbs, the Croats, and the Muslims. And it's, it's different culturally. Uh, how you communicate. Definitely. However, everybody wants to talk all the time. You just have to find their hot button. Ah, yeah, how to get you, them to talk. It's, it's the art of listening. Uh, for me, what really saved me uh, is that uh, I learned the 10 most effective feel-good ice-breaking questions. I was sold on the oh, process. Really? Yeah, that if you were to, if you could memorize these 10 most effective feel-good ice-breaking questions, you will always, always be able to carry conversation with anyone, anywhere, anytime. As soon as I heard about that, I was like, give me the questions. I'm not <laughs> a people person. I, I'm very task-oriented. I got that. Uh, I'm more dominant, direct, demanding in everything that I do, cautious, calculating, <laughs> conscientious. Yes. But I'm going to be evaluated by my ability to build relationships with people. I'm like, that would be a great business if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> Well, there you go. So let's talk about how this translates into what you do now and utilize it uh, to teach others some of the trade craft or spy craft sort of uh, techniques and tools. Um, you do different things. Uh, there's something you have called the disc. And I guess you, you're speaking now and you're teaching now and you've got some different materials people can sign up for on your website. Talk about what the disc uh, thing is. You have some stuff on here for disc assessments certification, training events, things you do about DISC? So it's a model. Uh, I'm a big advocate. I don't give a rip which one you choose to use. Just use mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. because they will make a difference in business or in your personal life because you have a model of reference. Mm -hmm. I chose that one because it was the easiest one to understand, easiest one to learn, easiest one to teach others. So it's based on Marston. It's the four temperament model of human behavior. One model is not better than the other. They're just different models. Just find one that works for you. We, you know, there's over a hundred different models out there to better understand the tendencies or better understand people. Enneagram, uh, Strength Finder, uh, uh, the Neo, the MMPI, uh, Bank Code. There's just so many out there. Uh, uh, Myers Briggs. A lot of people uh, understand Myers Briggs. 360 degrees. Pick one master it, put in the time and the effort and all this. So I've accumulated over 30,000 hours in the four temperament model of human behavior, studying, uh, teaching, and certifying people within that tool. So everything that I do uh, has a behavioral based approach. So if I'm working with a coach, I'm going to get them accredited and certified in utilizing that tool. And now they can do coaching as a behavioral based coaching approach. Or you're going to do some onboarding within your staff. You want to hire. Okay, well, let's do role assessments to find the temperament styles that you're looking for ah. so that you can market based to the temperament style that you're looking for. So mm -hmm. then when you hire, now you can have a behavioral based onboarding training program so that you retain them longer because you know in uh, 90 days i think 30 percent of people, new hires after 90 days are looking for an exit strategy so wow. uh, by having a behavioral based approach to onboarding to marketing to uh, presenting your products uh, quite often people put a lot of information in the written format great that's one third general population uh, two thirds of your audience are more people oriented Mm -hmm. based on the research. Therefore, you need both a written format and you need the video of you reading the written format. Mm -hmm. It's a different type of uh, industry. It's a different type of air. So uh, for me, when I learned about the 10 most effective feel-good ice-breaking question, guess what? Now I have it on my website. You, you know, off you go. You can use it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's amazing how it actually works. The first question is, how did you ever get interested in the widget business? Mm. So you really have to be curious when you're asking that question. So when I was handed my first case in, in, uh, in Bosnia, uh, the gentleman uh, was branded as a self-declared mayor of Mostar. So you can, uh, yeah, he had a, that persona. <laughs> and like, how am I going to get that persona to like me? Mm -hmm. So, well, I know the mechanics, as in I went to spy school in the UK to be a contact handler, spent a month there, and then I deployed. 
uh, I'm like, okay, so uh, we're supposed to say uh, good morning in Sobrokro, as well, Dobro Yutro, Yasim Jean Jacques, Kakaste, as then they appreciate the, the, the effort of being able to communicate in their, in their language. Uh, and then from there, you have to work with an interpreter. But the interpreter is not here, the interpreter is on the sides. But you still have to keep your eye on the, on the contact, on the person of interest. And the interpreter at the end will disappear because you're just keeping your eye with them. And then so we're doing the exchange. Uh, so my first question to him was, I'm just curious. See, those three words, by the way, Chris, I'm just, just curious. curious. As soon as you say that to someone, mm -hmm. their subconscious mind stays open. All, mm -hmm. all the distraction of maybe people on the phone or whatnot goes away. I'm just curious. Oh, what are you curious about? There you go. First question, how did you ever get interested in politics? Uh -huh. I just replaced the word widget. How did you ever, I'm just curious, how did you ever get interested in politics? Now, the research says that if you ask that question in the right time, the right moment, with the right person, they'll talk for 10 to 15 minutes nonstop. Wow. He did not follow that course because he talked for 30 to 40 minutes nonstop. <laughs> He kept on going and going and going, and I'm just, and he's providing me a lot of clues and cues for yeah. me to read, to read his preferred communication style. So the model comes in play mm -hmm. here. Of here's the two P's to decoding one's preferred communication style. I like simplifying things for application. So when I'm interacting with someone, regardless of their culture, regardless of where they're coming from, they all have a preference. We all have a preference, and. Science shows that a child's preference is already set at the age of four to five. Mm. Are you more outgoing or are you more reserved? As in, do you prefer more a fast pace or a slower pace? We, we have a preference. We can be 51% one side, 49% the other. It doesn't matter, but we do have a preference. So as he's communicating, I'm looking at the pace perspective. <clears throat> is, he, is he talking to me rapidly, fast, or slowly, conservatively? Is he loud or is he soft-spoken? Where, mm. where is he on that scale? That's the pace perspective. And then from the pace perspective, then you start looking at the priority perspective. Is he using more task-oriented words? Or is he using more feeling-oriented words? An example would be, if I was to ask you, Chris, uh, so uh, uh, what do you feel we should do after this presentation? Well, you know, if you're from that people side, you would respond, well, I feel. But if you're not, it, it's hard to respond to that. Mm -hmm. I was to say, well, uh, what do you think we should do? Well, if you're not from that quadrant, and it's like, well, I don't know. Now, if you say, well, so what do you think or feel we should do? What do you feel or think we should do? Thinking things through, feeling things through. They will respond, well, I think, ding, 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 I need to go more task with this individual. Ah. Well, I feel, ding, 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 they would prefer more feeling. So... It gives you aware, uh, you know, they're giving you all the clues and cues of their preferred communication style. You cannot not communicate. And by having a model of reference <clears throat> in your repertoire, there's a French word of the day, <laughs> you activate this little piece of the brain, you know, before, behind your left ear, you know, your RAS, your reticular activating system, whatever you're mm -hmm. looking for is looking for you. So if you're looking to decode, discern their preferred communication style, just start observing the pace perspective. And then the priority perspective. And then from there, you'll find that they'll fit into four main areas, four, four personas. So if they're a little bit more outgoing, right, in their ways and very task oriented, well, that persona will prefer you to communicate in a firm manner. So I'm going to give you the four legal F words. To <laughs> the legal F words. In a firm manner. Can you just, just, just be, just, just, just speak it out. That's very refreshing when you speak your mind. They speak in a firm manner. Others, they may be outgoing, but they're the life of the party. Guess what? They will want you to communicate in a fun manner. You know, smile a little bit. Mm -hmm. right? Enjoy yourself. Others, and when they're more reserved, and let's say reserve on the people side, well, that quadrant, you know, they would prefer for you to communicate in a friendly manner. So check oh. your tone and be friendly and, mm -hmm. and it's absolutely and stick out. Oh, and, and then if you're still reserved, yet you have a lot of questions, right? You're just curious, you got a lot of questions. Well, they will want you to communicate in a factual matter when mm -hmm. connecting with people matters. So 
by discerning one's preferred communication style, know before you show. For key four words, know before you show. Before you show that product, that service, that opportunity to your client, you need to know before you show what's their preferred communication style. Hmm. You know, have a start point. Can you say the same thing in a firm, fun, friendly, or factual matter? So learning to say the same thing in, in, in four ways. I come from that persona that, that tends to be a little bit more direct. And when I was studying with Dr. Rome in, uh, in Atlanta, oh my God, the funny moment, September of 1999, still remember it. He said to me, JJ, got my attention, yeah? Let me show you how you can annoy 90% of the general population just by being yourself. <laughs> what the fuck? How did you know that? Because <laughs> I happen that, that persona tends to be the smallest group of the general population. I oh, really? My homies, yeah. <clears throat> the, the military attracts, the special forces attract a lot of those personas. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but they're, you know, the, they're the smallest group of the general population, 10 to 15%, plus or minus, give or take. And what was fascinating is that I, uh, I understood this. And what I heard is I'm leaving a lot of the money on the table. Mm. In business, I'm leaving a lot of money on the table because I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. But I'm doing pretty good with my personas. Yeah. But what about the other? 90%. Then he said to me, JJ, would you be willing? I'm just curious. Would you be willing to learn to say the same thing in a different way? What do you mean the same thing? Uh, is it, there's a different way? <laughs> so I was ready, right? I was ready. We, we, we hear that famous uh, saying. I, I've heard it before, but I really, it, it resonated with me at that time. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Well, guess what? Uh -huh. The teacher appeared in September of 1999 in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, so, I love this data because, you know, I've, I've kind of tuned into when people use language where they say think or emotion. It helps me identify masculine and feminine. It helps me identify um, if, if they're in that emotional sort of brainwave or, or brain sphere, hemisphere, if you will, uh, or if they're in that logic thing. But I love this four, these four keys and how people, uh, you know, have those personalities and how you can identify them. And all of it's really, uh, a lot of it's about gaining rapport, right? And developing... Oh. Uh, a relationship, right? You've, you've, that's the first thing that they kept on harp, harping, hammering in over and over and over in the UK. Mm -hmm. Rapport, rapport, rapport. Yeah. And then I'm like, rapport, is that two P's or one P in rapport? <laughs> I'm like, what, what's, what's, what's rapport? Is it French or? Rapport, rapport. So it's very similar. Yeah. And you, they kept on ad, uh, advocating that a contact handler has to establish and maintain rapport with people. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay. How do you do that? Well, you know, you just have to establish rapport. I got it. How do you do that? How do you do that? <laughs> well, you just do it. What's the model of reference? How do you do that? Huh? So because over there, it's an instructor teaching the lesson plan of the past instructor. Because, oh, okay. do, right, they do a year or two years, and then they move, and they come back, take the lessons plan. And um, – a few years before, I was uh, back in, in the UK, and I was on an interrogator course. So prisoner handling and tactical questioning, I was on my interrogator course. And uh, that was something uh, because we, we didn't train that way in, in Canada. Uh, first of all, all I heard is, who wants to go to the UK? And I'm like, well, I, I, I want to go to the UK. And, and then they sent me to the UK for a seven-day course. I'm like, seven days? As in, do we have weekend off? No, there's no weekend off. It's it's it starts on a on a Sunday and it finishes on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. I'm like seven days, really? No, you don't you don't that, that's a makes really. Anyways, and in the first hour, Chris, I was taken, stripped naked, thrown into a cell, and interrogated. It's Friday. That was not on the curriculum. <laughs> what does that what does that say that I was going? Yeah, and. The, the the warrant officer that was like just he, he did what they what we call a harsh interrogation nine minutes nonstop of yelling wow Is it, he ever going to breathe like he was ticked off or something I mean because I'm Canadian I don't know but when you don't have anything on you everything is on play everything is vulnerable so if you have yeah. any weird things going tattoos or whatnot guess what it's coming yeah. out. And I never knew you could put so many swear words in sentences 
uh, so he goes up and down and and I'm and I'm just standing there because I know I'm supposed to say I cannot answer that question. Even when I said I'm not, oh, I cannot answer that question, he go and he already knew that I was going to say that, and he just chastised me even more. Okay, well I'm not going to say that again. Uh, anyways, I was flaring and my fists were. I'm like, mm. and and then it's like, okay, get dressed, get back in the classroom. I'm like, what am I doing here? I'm like, I'm in over my head. I, I, Some I'm people like, pay for that treatment, you know. Shock, shock and awe. But <laughs> as I was leaving, because we had four interrogations going at the same time, so all the doors open, mm -hmm. four of us, the four of the part, you know, we're, we're coming out, and no one's looking at each other. We're just looking at the at the floor because we just got you know violated. And we're sitting, and I was student number three. And then when everyone was finished, all the instructors lined up. And, and he started like debriefing us and it's okay. Uh, number three. And he started going everything that he was able to capture flabbergasted. How the really? heck did you know uh -huh. all this? Because I didn't answer any of his questions. Uh -huh. Not one question. I haven't, didn't answer one of them, but he was, he knew exactly my triggers. He knew exactly what was going through my mind. And he uh -huh. attributed this to something called BSA behavioral symptom analysis. Hmm. And I became a student. I was like, tell me more about that. But they couldn't tell me more about that because like, where, where did you take those uh, that resource, that information? Where does it come from? And when I was, you know, looking, doing research, uh, later on in, in my career, uh, I, I went down to get certified in NLP, neuro linguistic programming, 125 mm -hmm. hours, and in that program, that's where I saw ah, behavioral symptom analysis. Mm. You cannot not communicate. It's being able to read people's physiology. I'm better. At reading people's physiology because I have a model of reference that D persona will project a certain way but the S persona will also project a different way but if they're lying it you know, shows in a different it manifests itself differently and if they're telling the truth it manifests differently as in you can misread people because you don't have a model of reference someone that is shy could also look like someone is holding back on information mm. so the persona itself as in having the model of reference makes me better at utilizing uh, NLP as a neurolinguistic programming it makes me better at using all the other tools because I have that foundation, that mm -hmm. model of reference, then I can put everything on top and understand that, okay, how does that apply from a D persona, an I persona, an S persona? There are four main personas, but combined together, you will have 41 different style blends. Wow. So when you're good at reading the one persona, now you can start blending because 80% general population will have at least two to three traits together. Mm -hmm. So I'm a DC style blend. So more dominant and cautious. My wife, Julie, my business partner, she's an S C I style blend. And that's a supportive, cautious, inspiring style blend. Oh. I really have to listen. What's the issue? Is it an S issue? Is it a C issue? Is it an eye issue? Oh crap! Am I the issue? What's the issue? So you're always uh, the issue. So yeah, that's how. Well, it works actually, for all, I that's how it works for all husbands. I actually documented it. I put it on the website as a talk. Um, I wanted to get back uh, speaking after COVID uh, and and come up with a new subject. So I wrote the uh, uh, how to successfully navigate hostile environments using the F word. So, ah. So now, does that work when does that work when the wife says to you or the girlfriend says to you uh, like I get where uh, we need to talk? Does that is the F word uh, thing? Well, environment? the story that I shared on the stage was that I had just finished three days of training mm -hmm. with uh, the senior attaches. Um, you're putting in 14, 16 hour days, uh, and the last day I specialize in the field of or I've been training them on elicitation and how to counter elicit as in how to avoid being elicited for information oh. uh so um it's it was a fall evening i'm at the house i've used all my words i don't know the research will show that men will use anywhere from five to eight thousand words in their day and uh, women can use anywhere from 20 to thirty-five thousand words in their day <laughs> so i used all mine twice that day i'm i'm mm. i'm tapped out uh but julie hasn't had that her opportunity to use all her words uh, so after supper, we're, we're sitting down uh, in the living room. We're having a, a cup of tea. And, and then she's just, you know, she's going at it. Uh, and, and then, but she's not asking questions, Chris. 
she's making a statement with a pitch, which is a form of elicitation. Huh. I just like, oh, it's raining? It's raining. It's raining? And just by that pitch, you're supposed to add your, your say. I can't believe she said that on the phone, right? And I'm just, I'm just not buying in. I'm just there. And then she says to me, looks at me and says, why aren't you answering any of my questions? And without thinking, I looked at her and I said, I don't feel obligated in answering all your questions. Oh, wow. Now, you know, <laughs> as a recognized global authority in communication and relationship development, I read the change in her physiology. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought by adding these three words, it would save my gluteus maximus. Uh -huh. I looked at her and I said, at this time. I'm happy to talk about it a little bit later, but not right now. I'm, I'm tired. Uh -huh. right? So I don't feel obligated to answer your questions at this time. And then she goes, obligated? And then she stood up and she did the, you know, when you put your ear. Yeah. You got a frying pan hit. coming at you soon there, buddy. Well, something like that. Obligated? Uh -huh. You don't feel obligated? And, and then she, you know, she, she left uh, the room as in she went outside. So, and then I'm like, what do we do now? <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's such a, uh, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to put it on there. So on the website, mm -hmm. if you go to the speaking, it's a 20 minute uh, presentation. Uh, and then at the end, the audience gets a chance to vote. So uh, from there, I'm now a three time award winning speaker as in that's the presentation that I did. Mm -hmm. um, and then I use that story as in, I don't feel obligated. So I give uh, guys hope because then the guys can look at their wives. Hey, I'm not as bad as JJ. So yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh, you know, I, I, you, you should teach courses for people in dating. I need that for dating and relationships and stuff because, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's rough now at 55 and, and, uh, a lot of wow. the, a lot of the stuff out there is, uh, got a lot of emotional damage. It just so happens we do. <laughs> oh, do you? Okay. It I'm looking at your webs. I'm looking at your website. You do, uh, you help coaches and consultants. Uh, law enforcement, direct selling and sales. I, I love what you talked about with rapport. Jesus, it seems like that is such a lost art in sales nowadays. People yeah. just go right for the close. They just want to, you know, they want to skip the first, second, third base and go right to home base with you on closing you for a deal. Uh, you know, I get that all the time on, on email and LinkedIn. You know, it's like, hey, uh, we're a manufacturing reseller and uh, do you want to buy from us? And I'm like, do you, did you even check my LinkedIn? Like, what made you think that I'm interested in the manufacturing? Like, what the fuck? You are so off the mark of yep. qualifying me and gaining rapport, and they're just shotgunning it. Uh, you train corporations and government, enhanced investigative interviewing, which I love for jobs because if you if you spend the time and money to hire right, it uh -huh. saves you so much brain damage on the back end. And then you've the got some ladder as well. As in yeah. the first book that I co-authored, um, inside that book is my methodology in regards to how do you establish and maintain rapport. So I created the mm -hmm. report. And um, in every interaction that we will have with people, we will either complete or compete mm. with that interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, like two, you know, two D's competing, who's going to be in charge, two I's who's you know, competing, who's going to be the life of the party. So we either complete or compete. Now being French, I was writing the words and I'm like, did I spell this properly? Because it's the same letters, except one has the letter L in it. And then my brain went as in L. What's the L factor of completing an interaction until you can find a common link, common like, common love, no connection. Mm. You need to find that common link, that common like, that common love. It's so when you're looking at a ladder, you have to connect it to the ground, right? And solid foundation and leaning on solid foundation. And it will require energy to go up that ladder. Well, guess what? And uh, when it comes to establishing and maintaining rapport, it will require effort. There's also insights mm. as it, the ability to see things others overlook in regards to connecting it to a solid foundation, leaning it on the solid foundation and moving up. But there's four rungs on there. Now, if you are more on the task-oriented side of life, mm -hmm. before I can do business with you, I must first trust you. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're more on the people side of life, before I can do business with you, you must I must first like you. Ah. So one that needs trust first based on proof. Trust is earned. But on the other side, 
relationship comes first. Mm. Once I like you, I will trust you with my personal information. Oh. On the trust side, once I trust you, I will see that you have value and I will want to build a relationship with you. Mm. It's more of a professional relationship. So trust and relationship comes in. So it just comes in at a different different time. But at the end, rapport is the highest state of relatability. That's when that's when they sign the contract. That's when they put on the, on the Team USA jersey uh, as an operative. So there's four rungs on that ladder for you to be able to move to that state. And it took me two years just to, because I, I was there and I was just trying, testing things out. So mm -hmm. I can teach the other about how do you establish and maintain rapport. So it's listening, observing, and discerning and speaking. Listening, observing, discerning, and speaking. As in, you got to be listening to the other person first. Listening for the clues and cues. Uh -huh. for more outgoing reserve, task, or people. Discerning which quadrant, right? You're observe like because you listened, and now you're able to observe the mannerisms, their physiology, and and the words that they choose to use. Mm -hmm. Discerning, I'm sensing D, I, S, or C. And then speaking, put your no, provide your pitch or provide the information that you want to provide. What's interesting here is I turn that into a behavioral based uh, model because listening is an S attribute. They're the other, they are the professional listeners. The observing is a C attribute. They're, they're the other professional observers. Mm -hmm. Discerning, that's the D attribute. Right? They don't have a problem making decisions. And, and it's like, oh. And then, of course, the I speaking, yeah, they're all about speaking. So you need all four. That's sort of like the sequence in order for you to connect by design and not by chance, in order to establish and maintain rapport. So that's how you do the, the rapport ladder. So it's a, in that book uh, is that chapter. And then I wrote another uh, book, another chapter for another book that never did get published, but how to master rapport in the workplace. So rapport is so key, but you see how your mess is your message. I did not know how to build rapport because mm -hmm. spy school didn't teach me. They just said, you need to build rapport. Like, how <laughs> do you build rapport? They didn't have a model of reference. So from there, got it, I created my own. And now I'm able to teach it with others because like law enforcement, witness protection, they use the four temperament model of human behavior in their witness protection mm -hmm. because they want to change your persona. So you're not easy to be found. Ah, fantastic. Yeah. So they have to introduce a model of reference so that they understand so they don't resist it and then receive it. I'm like, hey, there you go. I'm going to do that at the office, try and make it so I don't be found. Note to self, buy some camouflage suits for the office. Um, well, JJ, it's been wonderful to have you on. Very insightful. And we could probably talk for hours. But, uh, you know, for the most part, uh, the data you have is just amazing as I've been going through your website. Uh, give us your final pitch on the show, how people can get a hold of you, reach out to you, see if there's some podico, gain rapport with you as well, et cetera, et cetera. Well, definitely the number one place to go is to the retirespy.com mm -hmm. landing page. I would scroll all the way down. Um, last week, we just put a complimentary uh, program on mastering the art of interpersonal relationships, both in French and in English. Mm -hmm. So you can choose your language. It's already there. It's four easy lessons. Uh, and then the fifth lesson, there is something special that was going to come out if you finish the race. So, but you know what? For me, um, Look at a model uh, as a model reference because raising your kids, it will greatly help. It helped me raise my son and my daughter uh, and then uh, celebrate 34 years of marriage uh, with my lovely wife. So uh, it makes a big difference because it's a force multiplied, multiplies your capabilities both in business and in your personal life. So start with the retirespy.com. And if you want to, there's a place where you can actually book a call with me, complimentary 30 minute call anywhere around the world. So that's your point of contact. There you go. Well, thank you very much, JJ, for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Deeply insightful and fun. And, uh, of course, you know, a, a lot of the stuff you use is great for building relationships, uh, for, you know, I, you know, we, we have this on the show where people come on the show and I have to, 
usually try and hopefully get some instant rapport with them and get to know them. You know, people I've never met. I do that when I go on planes, or when I travel, or mm-hmm. just about anywhere I go. I'll do that in the elevator just to be a shithead uh, because you know everyone's like, we have to stand and be quiet. And I'm like, oh fuck that. I'm gonna mess with people. Um, you know, I, I'm a rebel that way. But I'm I'm deeply interested in people, and that's why we do the show. I'm 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 sick of me. I'm over me. I've I've been dealing with me for 15 years or the audience has been dealing with me for 15 years. I've been dealing with me for 55, but uh, I'm, I'm interested in people. I'm, I'm interested in their, you know, why they choose their pathways, why they go down mm-hmm. through life. There's no one perfect way to do life. Um, I don't know, unless you're born into, I don't know, a billionaire family, but even then you're probably getting some issues. Um, but there you go. Uh, so thank you very much, JJ, for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. There you go. There you go. And thanks, Monitz, for tuning in. We couldn't do it without you either as well. Uh, go to Goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Foss. All billionaires, Pulitzer Prize winners, newsmakers, authors, CEOs we have on the show. Just some of the brilliantest minds, and you're just going to learn so much. Two to three shows every weekday, 10 to, f- uh, not every, yeah, every weekday, and 10 to 15 a week. I can't feel my legs anymore. There's so much content, people. Go listen to it all. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time. And that should do it. Thanks, JJ.